Hi guys, good afternoon or good day, wherever you are, depending on time zone. Um, it's good to know you are there and um, you followed the course um, from the module one through to now, um, indicative that you have resolved to pull it through. Um, right before us, this module five um, is the topic structuring and drafting the tender and contract. You know, tendering and structure, um, structuring and drafting of tenders, stroke contract is a phase in the process of consummating a PPP arrangement. And it's very critical. By getting to this point, means that the prospective um, PPP, um, PPP considerations for players are gaining much ground. They are advancing, they've passed the appraisal stage. They are now, they are now most, most likely going to um, get through successfully with the PPP arrangement. Um, so, so it's very critical at this point to be sure that the structures and the draftings of the tender and the contract are delicately attended to in the interest of both the private party and the public procuring party, such that it caters for issues that might pose um, misunderstandings or disputes. You know, and every interest is well and catered for. Um, so in the outline, we would look at objectives and purpose of the um, structure of the structuring phase, um, financial structuring from a public perspective, defining the financial structure and payment mechanism, risk identification, risk allocation, risk structuring, and risk matrix. All of these are critical to ensure all stakeholders' interests are well captured and then um, there are no misunderstandings or room for dispute, or it's really minimized to a significant extent. Um, testing, marketing, communications, and communicating the project before project launch. It's also part of this phase. Um, definition, defining qualification criteria. Um, in terms of structuring and drafting of request for qualification, structuring and drafting the request for proposal, defining proposals, um, requirements and then evaluation criteria, defining and drafting other commercial terms and contract provisions, and control checks, approvals, and approvals before the launching before launching the tender and planning ahead. So, so you see this, pro, this course or this model promises to be very robust. Um, I would see how fast and detailedly we could um, attempt this, um, but please put in mind that at, the, at this stage, um, the prospective PPP players uh, are sort of getting headway into deeper arrangements and meaning they have passed the screening and identification stage, they've passed the appraisal stage. And so they are they are heading for some meaningful arrangement. Though it doesn't mean that's the PPP operator that would might maybe win or lose the project. Um, that's it. Um, the main objective procedure contract structuring for tendering fees is, um, is to ensure that the procurement of the PPP project will be successful by, launch, by launching an affordable and feasible project that will deliver the desired value, desired level of service and value for money. So you see some key lines on, this, on the line. There's always a desired level of service and a value for money. Value for money is a construct that connotes 
Is this the best use of money? Are we using this money in the best interest of the public or is it wasteful? So once all those bl blurry lines in choice making, or public choice making are clarified, you want to also be, and it, you would be sure you are subjecting that to affordability, feasibility, assessments, and all of those. All of those feeds into what informs the structuring of a PPP contract and um, what goes into the tendering fees. So, 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 um, and then gives the guarantee that this project is headed for success. Yeah. So if all of these are put into context, the likelihood that a project fails is very minimal. Yeah. So that's it. Um, according to um, the APMG PPP reference guide, APMG is a body of knowledge on PPP um, in, um, floated by the World Bank to standardize the operation of PPP. And so, so, so you might be interested in going to the website to visit it and read more of it. Structuring PPP means allocating responsibilities, rights, and risks to each party. In the PPP contract, the public party has its places to fulfill, obligations to fulfill, the private party does. Yeah, so there are three main types of structuring. You want to talk about the financial and budgetary or fiscal structuring because PPPs, as even in the case of user pay, it is meant to be a relief to um, budgetary commitment of the government. But it doesn't strictly mean government might not have one or two financial commitments here and there. And in the case of actual government pay, it really means that government has pockets of financial commitment. And so that line of clearly structuring it such that you are clear on the financial obligations or the fiscal or the, or the budgetary obligations from the private sector side and equally from the public sector side. And even on the public sector side, if there are no explicit financial commitments, there might be commitments in kind, maybe waivers, maybe this and that, um, maybe. Uh, land land uh, easement access of way and all of those and some other things that by the time you 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 reduce it to financial models you really see that though you literally didn't give the money but you have compromised and made some financial financial um, sacrifices so so you need to those need to be structured between both parties and um, risk and as explicitly as possible, search that there are no assumptions and it turns out tomorrow that we thought you would do this, but this is not playing out and that's necessary. Risk, risk structuring, assigning an allocation of risk to each party. And that is also very necessary. Oftentimes government engages in PPP to, to, to transfer its risk of procuring and operating a project. And so that needs to be very clear. What are the risks the government is bequeathing or transferring to the private party? And such that there are no assumptions. Um, tender stroke procurement structuring. Yeah, and so that's also critical, especially qualification criteria and evaluation criteria. You need to structure those out. Actually, when the project is consummated, procurement structure, how do you procure this? What do you do this and do that? With, within the ambits of policy, sector policies, and um, regulations, and all of those. So uh, um, this, this, this uh, key in structuring, you want to look at these three dimensions to be sure nothing is left hanging. Um, why is structuring important? I think I have touched on that even from the, the definition we looked at. Principally, structure, the structuring of a contract must protect and maximize the potential value for money by defining the most appropriate financial and risk structures. And so, so, so it's, it's, it's important to maximize value for money through adequate structuring. And structuring is not structuring by just 
randomly thinking it's an explicit process we would see it down the presentation there's always there's going to be a risk matrix there are instruments for that there are, there are fiscal and uh, financial uh, feasibility analysis that would go into that to identify how our risks are portioned and all of those so 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 that's that and it helps to ensure transparency no party is feeling short changed no party is feeling there's something underneath the carpet that's not obvious to it everything is structured down to the nitty-gritty um, yeah so that's that um, um so so defining the financial structures and payment mechanisms um Financial structure refers to the means of public compensation or payment. This could take several forms, grants, service payment, um, service payment to the private partner who deliver the contract, or financing, financing in this case, equity or debt contribution, depending, you know, even a private party can come into a, a, a PPP arrangement and really don't have the fund of its own and might want to leverage leverage public funds like um, I said not, not public funds at this way but leverage leverage um, the financial intermediaries the bank or non-bank financial intermediaries depending on what the provisions of the financial regulatory ecosystem um, makes available. So, so um, this brings a case in the Nigerian power sector. When the Niger Nigerian government we had to privatize, yeah, I'm sorry I'm, I'm digressing to privatization, but the, the wisdom or the learnings there are quite similar. When they were to privatize, the private sector that we are interested sort of came with the know-how, the the, 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 the the innovation ideas to modernize the power power distribution transmit and ecosystem, but they don't have the money as it were to both acquire the private asset, the, the public asset, and also operate it in its full scale to deliver all the innovations or the propositions they were making. What they did was they were into, they entered into the financing arrangements with financial institutions, banks and all to acquire the property or the public assets from the government. And so it still plays out in PPP where a private party is up for a, 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 a a project bigger than its pocket, but for know-how and all the provisions or requirements for, for being the best operator or the best player for that project, it might be compliant. So it can always make for such financing arrangements. So, so in financing structure, we want to be clear. We don't want to be assuming, do you have the capacity for this? If you don't have, in adequate capacity, do you have provisions to make up for this? Have you, in, have you been in talks with the banks? Have you entered the necessary agreement? Are they comp comp compliant with it? Have you, you know, depending on all the nitty gritty of the agreements that go into that. However, it needs to be very, 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 very transparent and, and um, meticulous because in the place where arrangements fall apart, the whole PPP arrangement in itself can also fail. So you know, don't take chances. That's that. Um, so basic financial structures are usually defined um, at the appraisal stage, you know, but at this stage of structuring and tendering, more rigor is paid to, you know, the, as, as we progress, the, this whole effort gets deeper. The earlier stages, we are for screening and gradual narrowing down. 
of the many countries that come in. But as we get closer to the end of the cycle or the PPP cycle, um, we want to be sure that the final candidate is well screened, well assessed. So in structuring, we want to talk it through from the private and the public sector side. It's more like a round table time now. Yeah, it's not just the public sector sitting down to affect your documents and submission. The private sector also wants to sit out and hear the government side on the nitty gritties of their obligations and how there will be a convergence. Um, so, and many times, nothing is really as cast in stone. The private sector can come with a financial model or financing arrangement or, or, or an idea of um, a financial structure. Maybe they are proposing a service payment and the government is proposing an hybrid of a, 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 a part service payment and part government payment, or, or they are proposing a grant and they co-financed through maybe some funders uh, and the government is tinkering with that and there's a back and forth that's why at this process is iterative nothing is cast in stone the private sector wants to pick take feedback from the government the government but everything should be transparent many times you don't enter the room with one government official not two so that there are no room for compromises you don't want to bring different parastatals into the room that have key pockets of responsibilities in the PPP process. And you don't want to have independent PPP experts and advisors, maybe PPP practitioners like a legal firm that is into PPP advisory and arbitration. You want to bring them to the room so that everything is transparent. So that's that. Um, and so, so um, we, we, there are several key factors to consider in financial structuring um, of user pay PPPs. And I already told you if it's user pay, government pay, or whatever. You want to consider the tariff level, who sets the tariff, user pay PPP. Sometimes government, you, would, you, you are entitled to your tariff if it's a user pay PPP as a private sector, depending on how your financial models reach that for financial and uh, affordability and feasibility assessment. But the government might cap it because in the end, they're also interested in the economic welfare of the beneficiaries. They don't want them to be over, over levied. Um, they want to put into consideration um, equity or, or uh, yeah, um, they want to be sure that um, maybe the rich pay for more. Uh, they have all sort of thinking that goes into that. Uh, so you want to know who sets it. The government might be told the right to, uh, to set it from the private sector and say, we would, we would talk over it, but we would, we would regulate it. Or the private sector, you have the full hand, um, but we will backstop you to be sure we are compliant with our commitments to the people rather than exploiting them. Um, indexation, you want to be sure what parameters or index are you premising whatever analysis or financial structuring judgments you are making. Um, so, and this, this varies. It can be based on industry, industry indices. It can be based on maybe the gross domestic products or even consumer price index. It varies. It's, it's not cast in stone. And it's, it's sector specific some oftentimes. And you can relate to this as it, as, it, as it applies to your sector. I know in this meeting, there are government officials. In this class, there are government officials. There are also industry players in the construction sector, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the healthcare sector, in the educational sector. You want to be sure you are thinking in light of how it applies to your space. And then we have viability gap fin financing and funding upfront grants versus deferred. Um, so you need to talk it through. The obligations government has to make in a process, are they going to do it, give, give it after the project, after the service is offered or before? You need to look at it. Or the negotiations happening with the bank, is it after or before? 
the, the service is provided as top. All those nitty gritty needs to come through, or the modalities for setting up the special purpose vehicle and the different private parties that make up the special purpose vehicle. How are you making compromises? What are your terms? How is it coming to play? The government and the public sector party or the procuring party is interested in knowing everything. And they may have a say in how you do it. They might revise your choices. They might, there will be back and forth. So volume, and also we have volume risk guarantees. It might be, it might be a public-private partnership for a project that the success indicator is based on the volume of access or usage. And government might want to, like if it's a PPP for a public hospital, you know. The, the arrangement or the modalities of maybe a government PE might be based on volume that we give them would, would pay so 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 per patient. Yeah. And so you charge so 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 per patient, we subsidize it. So if you have 10 patients, they will pay 10 times the individual per head cost. They've made compromises on it's it's not as um, it's not as a um, very very, very, very basic as I have given you, but I have tried to leave that for your, um, for a very telescopic overview and um, picture painting of how this plays out. And um, that's that. Um, so, so, so um, not to buy much time, you, you, you'll be able to appreciate this in its depth. And I have spoken to, um, um, risk identification, risk allocation, risk structuring, and um, risk matrix, um, here and there. Um, but 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 I would like to establish that um, you, a critical in this process is a very explicit thinking through the risks. You know, this also, this is a portion for restructuring. We just finished financial structuring. Restructuring, think through the risks. And then a, 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 a tool to help that is what we call risk matrix. Risk matrix helps the government to organize and conduct risk analysis. The private sector too does its own risk matrix. Well, by the time the parties come together to the table, the government can be sure the private sector is not given a risk matrix that is maybe unfounded, or the government is not too overly conservative on the potential risks. You know, every party needs to be very uh, unequivocal about what works best so that the project won't have a, 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 a challenge. Any, any risk that is not paid attention to will become a challenge to the party that took that risk, that accepted that risk, or the party for which the risk is, is, is apportioned to. So, so, so this is a point where every party needs to really articulate its risk matrix, pay attention to the risk name, don't just give it some random blurry thoughts, name the risk, describe the risk, the effects of the risk and consequences, measure and mitigate, measurements and execution arrangements for the risk we are available, and who name the party against whom the risk is allocated. So, so the risk matrix helps to take care of that. Um, so, so, and then um, we, we we understand that we have quantitative risk assessment. Sometimes you can reduce risks to quantitative quantitatives so that you can be able to measure the or make comparisons on risk options. Um, that means if this risk is this severe based on maybe what we are expecting on the project, or can we change this? Can we change that? Maybe to attenuate this risk to 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 change the the potential impact of this risk. You know, all of those need to go into the picture. Um, the most likely um, 
outcome it can it can be can, it can be calculated from what's the most most likely of possible outcomes because risk is not something that is certain it's just let's think ahead and provide for occasions of this occurring it might not occur so you might want to calculate for risk based on likelihood of occurrence some would have more likelihood of occurrence like doing a construction project around a rainy season you'll be sure there might be wind that might destroy portions of the construction efforts you want to be sure who bears that risk and if it's the private sector are you ready to go ahead with this you don't know how colossal the impact might be but it's feasible that it's possible that this happens you know you want to you don't want to keep anything hanging you want to in a project you want to be sure that oh there are times there might be social unrest and there might be vandalism of efforts that have been impacted on by the private party who bears that risk is it the, the party private party or the government in case of social unrest in case of forced merger who bears the risk you want to be very nitty-gritty about the full range of possible outcomes in this case you might also want to go the full range of possible outcomes but there are alternatives for going the full range of uh, rather going for most possible outcomes so so you want to negotiate with the private party the public party so we would love to use the full range of possible or we want to use most likely outcomes we don't want to you know those needs to come true in a structuring um of um, a, a ppp tendering con pr contract process um, um, so, so there is also qualitative risk assessments. There are some risks you can't reduce to numbers, but they are possibly um, they are they are possibly inevitable or maybe evitable sometimes. But you just don't want to take chances. I want to articulate them. Risk of theft. You don't know what the magnitude of theft might be. The risk of even incurring fines. Yeah, a private party can still be fined by the government because maybe it was it's maybe it struck flouted traffic rules and were impounded by by by, by the road officials. They, although that's a private sector risk, it will be a risk, but you need to articulate it. And sometimes those risks you don't have figures to attach to them. So the likelihood and probability of such risk occurring in the And the government is interested in saying it. The government, the, the, the risk on the government side, they have their own risks too that they want to put out. So, and both parties need to transparently observe this, negotiate it over and come to final terms before the contract is consummated. Um, and there are risks that you can, quantitative, qualitative risks too that you could still take to, guess estimates or expectations of the size and relevance in terms of financial impact and um, not because you can be precise on the figure such risks are though they are qualitative risks but you can consider them as semi-quantitative risks and so you you know how it applies within your sector um, whether it's health whether it's um, environment or whatever you, you would always put that into context appropriately. Um, so, so, so um, other con con terminologies in this whole effort of um, structuring of um, 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 contracts and tender processes are market testing. To even sometimes get a good feedback on what the risk might be. The, for the same project, the risk might be different in climes in environments, in communities, in different geopolitical territories of a country. So, so, so you want to do actual market testing to really get a feedback from key stakeholders within the environment where the project ideally wants to be consummated. So that's where market testing comes to be. It's from there you might hear that there are different customary obligations here that obtains for this local community and that. And you put that into context. 
else you'll be entering a contract in, 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 in blindly without taking care of gaps. There might be land tenure issues that are peculiar to the, the environment where the project is to be consummated that are within the customary laws and provisions that have been legislated. So it's not illegitimate. So if you are oblivious to that, because maybe there's a project elsewhere that didn't have such issues, it might become a risk, a challenge, a financial issue. Maybe it should have been factored into the financial, financial models or stuff. So all of those need to be taken into context. And project marketing. They are in, in this process to his need to market the project like have an issue. People need to know that this is coming to town. This is going to be this is the new development and all of those. And even in the course of that, too, there, are in, there will be intelligence guidance on how to better meet the needs of the people. So this happens within this period of establishing the contract such that the contract is well worded for the right purposes and all of those. So it happens this way. Yeah. It's key to take note of that term. And, and communication with the public, I think I've touched on it in the earlier slide and you can just appreciate that. And many PPP projects have failed to see the light of the day or have been canceled because of public resistance and opposition. And that comes with there are, uh, there are optics, there are modalities to manage this. You know, in the end, projects are for the users. And those communications need to come clear and correct. There can be miscommunications that can happen, especially if there is political connotations to a project, well intentioned. Maybe a project is about to be consummated, and then an opposition party is feeling they want to they want to foil the effort of the existing or incumbent government, and they are passing wrong communications. It's the onus of the project players and the parties in the process, both private public, to put the information straight, to to make public and transparent everything going into the consummation of the project and all of those. So that should not be neglected, and it's key at this at this advanced stage of the PPP um, arrangement. Yeah. So 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 we can always appreciate all of this. It will help you to achieve great PPP projects across your sectors. Um, um, so 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 very quickly. Um, we also know that there are always qualification criteria as I've established earlier. And, and this could be grouped into three, administrative and legal, financial, economic capacity, and technical capacity, capability. All of this, the private sector and the public sector might need to at this advanced stage, because I know this we are all factored in at identification and even appraisal, but at this advanced stage, there needs to be a revalidation and because at this advanced stage, there might be more insights from observations of the nature of the projects, from, from the direction of the negotiations, of the interactions on both the public side, public sector side and the private sector side, from the market assessment, from the, from the communications with the public, all of those, there might be pockets of adjustments that are informing what finally would be. So all this needs to be put in consideration um, um, to determine the qualification criteria and all at the end, because at this stage, it's not like the final PPP player has been chosen. It's a, it's a set of maybe eligible players that are well advanced in the process of being selected. So these are the processes that still would screen to pick the best of the best. Um, that's that. And then a request for proposal. Um, it's, I know they've tendered an initial proposal, an initial expression of interest, um, but there might be rooms to go and make moderate revisions here and there to augment. And, and this does not put the, the initial entrance of 
of like they were disadvantaged. No, there are ethics to this. Um, where, where the conversations that is progressed dynamically might create rooms for further, for that. But but I mean this happens transparently with all parties, the independent um, observers or the independent experts in the room, and all of so that there is no situation of connival or um or or round tripping or or abuse of the process for corrupt purposes. Um, so um, that and all of this you can appreciate. Um, defining and drafting other commercial terms and contract provisions. Um, a well-designed contract is clear, comprehensive, and creates certainty for the contracting parties. Remember I told you, and the point of structuring is with what structure that goes into a contract, but be it financial constructuring, risk structuring, and all of those, and also considering the administrative um, requirements that goes into evaluation and all of those. All those fits into the final contract document that each party would countersign. And yeah, so and you know once you countersign, you are obligated to what you signed against. And so so that's that to reduce conflicts, disputes, reasons for arbitration and fines and all of those, this needs to be very carefully done. Um, main provisions in the PPP contract, obligations and rights and risks, changes, and disputes. I mean, in a PPP contract, there should also be clauses providing for disputes and all of those. Because it might be inevitable, but if the risks, the changes, and the obligations or rights are all couched explicitly and as exhaustively as both parties can negotiate, the chances for dispute is more um, slim. And so, Let's put that into context. They are thinking that the sector expert do, do proper research and due diligence and would you know, go to the negotiation flow, not to exploit, but to adequately secure your interest. Um, because you might have good financial structuring, but when you neglect some risk, some risk can erode the structures you've put in place to, to, to be profitable and viable. So it still boils down to viability, feasibility, affordability, and all of those that goes into determining um, who is eligible for a project. Um, who is eligible for a project. Um, so 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 um, I think at this critical point. We want to be sure that you have some sort of rubric, rubric, rubric is like a yardstick, something that sort of helps you, you know. So, so you want to check a checklist um, that allows for verification of the structuring process. The structuring process can be very dirty and technical. So just as this issue, technical feasibility and legal due diligence, they were taken care of. Positive or sound cost benefit analysis or results, are they well, well marshaled? Marshall feasibility, affordability limits, positives, positive or acceptable value for money, and benchmarks or thresholds have they been well negotiated to the nitty gritty of it. Legal feasibility of contract structure and then that even it might be, it might boil down to a, the way a, a clause is written, even though the surface, surface value of that expression is clear, but the way it's written and the possible interpretation that might emanate from it, might be a huge concern such that you don't sign into something you thought was you thought meant otherwise then in the law court is interpreted differently so, so so those need to go in 
very meticulously before a contract is consummated and reasonably accepted, acceptable to all parties. Um, examples of prerequisites for successful PPP tendering process. You want to, um, yeah, you want to check the political commitment of the government to this legal legislative structures that could that could pose um, concerns for operations because you don't contravene the constitution in delivering a PPP either from the public side or the private side. So anything that is in the contract that some we later on contravenes that is altogether um, null and void by the, when placed side by side with existing constitution, existing policies, policies that pre-existed before the contract and all of them. So um, regulatory, regular deal flow, you want to check. Um, hope this is feasible for us, for our viability and profitability, capacity building. We want to be sure because um, the procurement team should have clarity on the roles and responsibilities in projects. And then the team needs to be well staffed, trained, and all of those such that there are no deficiencies. So there, there might be hydration and there might be turnover of staff. So we are a, 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 procure, a, a private party knows they can commit to doing this, doing that, but maybe they had a turnover of staff, and they, should, they, they want to be sure that there is no knowledge gap in the delivery of the project through the cycle because someone has left the team, maybe by call of nature, death or stuff. And so they want to be sure there's a good succession and there's learning and anybody that comes in can fit appropriately into the shoes of any other person that existed there before. You know, all those nuances need to be touched through. Um, the procurement process should be transparent, streamlined processes. It should be added, there should be adherence to predefined timelines, all of those, if they are well taken care of. Then the structuring of a contract and tender process would serve the interest of all. Um, at this juncture, you might have questions, you might have concerns. Please do not hesitate to get to the dashboard, head them, and then we are standing by to be of help to you. Um, thank you for your time.